say, well, we're, we've only been sophisticated for less than 6,000 years. Then you go, oh, well, we're, we're quite a young, uh, you know, quite a young being then. But if you say, no, our ancestors go back 12, 15, or more thousand years, that knowledge gives you power as a human being, that our ancestors were incredible people, and that we can reinvent what they knew and take back our personal sovereignty. I think people are coming around to these understandings that, wow, that the past civilizations, the indigenous tribes that corporations and governments are trying to murder all around the planet right now, have the wisdom to save the planet. And we should respect what people have done in the past and in some cases adopt exactly the way they've mm -hmm. done it rather than trying to tinker. They didn't all do it right, that's for sure. But we have to look at what they did right and we have to get out of the mess we're in. There seems to be today a tendency to reject or disrespect what our ancestors did. Reinforce the necessity to remember our history. It's a huge puzzle and no one person has all the pieces. For me, if I could just contribute one piece and keep putting it out there and keep putting it out until the right people get a hold of it, that's all that matters. Is it possible that by taking another look at our ancient past, we may have a chance to solve the problems of the future? In order to gather some information on our ancient history, our crew of five traveled to Peru, where we met with our guide and ancient technology expert, Brian Forrester. Brian took us to several locations around Peru that gave us great insight to the ways of our ancient ancestors. We're heading for the Cori Cancha, which is and always has been the spiritual center of Cusco. But the most intriguing thing about it is that it is one of the buildings that was here thousands of years before the Inca even existed. Most people think that the Inca built this city. The Inca actually found this city abandoned and then they rebuilt it. And we'll see evidence of that in the stone construction. So what we know from history is the Inca arrived at this place called Cusco about 1100 or 1200 AD, and they were decimated by the Spanish in 1533. Now that's not a very long time span, and how is it possible that they went from constructing a wall like that to a wall like that? The more research we're doing, and this is multidisciplinary, it's geologists, engineers, myself, and many others who are now finding out that in fact, this wall came first and then later the Inca built this wall. What we're looking at here at the Cori Cancha is conceivably a stone wall 38 inches in depth, seamless. You can't fit a human hair in between these stones. And this wall could be 12,000 years old. One curious thing is that the type of stone that these builders wanted to use was very specific and they would go as far as required, sometimes as far as 50 miles away from Cusco to bring the stone to build these walls. The Inca discovered an abandoned city. They named it Cusco, which means the city of stone. And then they occupied this space and built their city around it out of profound admiration for these mysterious ancestors who had built the city originally in very, very ancient times. There's a, a compelling case to be made that there was a, a motherland and, and this information was dispersed, the engineering techniques, spirituality. From there you had, you know, maybe ancient survivors that all these myths and legends talk about that built structures like mounds and the work at, you know, Puma Punku and, and um, Saksiwam. You know, you have pyramids on both sides of the Atlantic and they both incorporate power and they have equal legends of giants coming, you know, Zawi Hawass wouldn't like the idea, but if you talk to somebody from Egypt who uh, understands their, their oral traditions, they would say yes, you know, they, they would point more to an Atlantis-like civilization washing up on the shores 12,000 years ago. Yeah, Dr. Robert Schock, John Anthony West have done some great um, things about redating the Sphinx. Christopher Dunn, Brian Forrester, you see so many people that make a compelling case like something else was going on. While traveling through Peru, we witnessed some incredible evidence. Evidence that gives rise to the possibility of a forgotten ancient civilization. The remains of these ancient civilizations suggest they may have been much more advanced than previously thought. 
There may not be much remaining from these ancient cultures, but what does remain seems to confuse and intrigue researchers from around the world. Okay, Trevor, so here we're looking at some interesting artifacts, especially if you look up here. We've seen a lot of examples of where cubes have been removed seemingly from the bedrock. This is one of the best examples there is. You can cut through this way, that way, top and bottom, but how do you get to the back to cut it out, unless you're taking it out in tiny pieces? We don't see multiple incision marks of where it really would have taken it chunk by chunk. It looks like it was done one fell swoop. This is red granite, and this comes from across the valley and more than a thousand feet up in a quarry. This is a tiny one. Once we get up to the Sun Temple, we'll see stones which are finished at 40 to 60 tons in weight. Yesterday we got to explore an area called Zone X by the locals. It's actually probably three miles from Saxe Oman and uh, way up higher in elevation. Massive stones shaped, I'd say. It's definitely more of a shaping than a carving. Absolutely no tool marks. Everything's rounded and smooth. So what we're looking at here are two completely different ages of construction. And it's so painfully obvious that this is pre-Columbian just because of the patina and the wear on the stone. And what we're looking at is this polygonal work. There's nowhere that I can see that there's any evidence of tool marks. We don't see bruising of the stone where stone hammers would have struck it. And then above it, and fitting in, you see smaller and rougher stone filled with clay, clay mortar. This is Inca construction that we're looking at. And this lower area is the megalithic. Because of the tightness of the fit, you can see that each one of these polygonal shapes was very carefully fit into place with little or no mortar. And since this is superior to that, then whoever made this work was a more advanced technological society than the Inca. The question is, how long ago was this made? There are no oral tradition records except for the discussion of an obscure people called the Pirwas, who arrived here 40 years after the Great Flood. Ah, los Pirwas. Bueno, los Pirwas fueron los primeros habitantes de, de, del Tahuantinsuyo. Pirwas were the first inhabitants of the Tahuantinsuyo. Ellos vienen de la Atlántida cuando la, uh, se produce el diluvio universal they y came, se hunde la Atlántida, salen a repoblar el mundo. They came from the Atlantis uh -huh. after the flooding and start populating the earth. Salen a repoblar el mundo y vienen buscando el eje magnético de la Tierra y lo encuentran en el Cusco. Por eso la palabra Cusco es el ombligo del mundo. Los Pirwas fueron los que entraron al Coricancha o hallaron el Coricancha. No, ellos sí. hicieron el Coricancha. They were the, one, the builders of the Coricancha. Ellos han construido Machu Picchu, Sacsayhuaman, todo lo que nosotros conocemos, okay. incluido el Coricancha y todo el Cusco. Porque la única ciudad en el mundo que está construida al revés, arquitectónicamente no existe otra ciudad como el Cusco, porque las piedras son trabadas y no tienen cemento. Están hechas así para absorber la fuerza telúrica. Cuanto más terremotos, mejor las piedras se acomodan mejor. Y el, el Cusco se vuelve más eterno cada vez. Es indestructible. Si los españoles no hubieran sacado piedra por piedra, el Cusco seguiría intacto hasta ahora. Esa tecnología no existía en el planeta Tierra. Y posiblemente los piruas son los primeros que traen esa. Ellos son los que construyen Sacsayhuaman, Ollanta, Machu Picchu y todo eso. ¿no? Existen 200 emperadores, existían 200 emperadores, de los cuales 60 eran los piruas. Después vienen 40 los amautas que eran intelectuales. Después viene la dinastía de los Capas, que eran guerreros expansivos. Y por último, los Incas, que no son los que han hecho Machu Picchu ni Saxoamán. Ellos han venido a habitar lo que ya estaba construido, hecho. So, Trevor, we've seen a lot of examples so far of um, strange things cut out of the solid stone. And this, what we're about to uh, see, is a really classic example of that. And again, it's not something tourists generally get to have a look at because it's not um, part of 
99.9% of tourist mm -hmm. programs, and that's why I wanted to show you guys this stuff. And when I brought uh, stonemasons up here and asked them, is this a quarry, they'd say, well, I can see how they could have cut through this way and how they could have cut through that way, but how would they have come up and cut through the back to pull it out? And since the stone is flawed anyway, it would have crumbled. So this, again, is probably an example of the lost ancient technology of a very ancient culture. And everyone, including myself, are still stupefied to this day as to why they would do this kind of work. Well, no evidence I can see of tool marks. This is rare, mm -hmm. and that this one is quite sharp. Usually they're rounded like that. Mm -hmm. You can basically put your finger there, and it fits into that pattern. And it's just wide enough to walk through shoulder width. So watch your head up here. Mm -hmm. This probably was completely flat, and then the clay from the top of the rock slowly is washed out and deposited with the rainfall. Yeah, this, this all here is just clay. It'll just come right off if I keep scraping it. Oh, yeah. Wow. This is the first place that actually makes sense where they found the rock they need, they cut out, and they took all of it. What doesn't make sense is something like this. Why would you put so much effort to take just a, an inch or two of rock coming out of there? We saw a lot of evidence yesterday that civilization goes in cycles. It's, um, it's not linear, and we aren't more advanced today than we were in the past. Chances are, um, in the past, people knew how to do stuff that we have no clue um, how to reproduce today. So what you're looking at behind me is called the Cori Cancha, which means the courtyard of gold. This is thought actually to have been the first building that the Inca ever built, about the year 1100. But what we'll see in the interior is it's also the finest craftsmanship you can see in stone in the Americas. So follow this, follow my finger as we see an incredibly complicated piece of stonework. This joint goes this way and that way, and then it goes around the corner. And again, this is still one stone. And it goes around this corner, and around that corner, and finally comes down like that. Now that's a very complicated matrix of one piece of stone. There is no reason why this would be done for structural purposes. It's simply the fact that whoever had the ability in the ancient times, before the Inca, to do this work, found this to be a relatively simple thing to do, but even modern stonemasons will be mind blown when they see this little bit of film footage. So what we're looking at here is clearly an example of lost ancient technology. Some kind of drill bored through this hard basalt stone. And by using this light, I'll show you. Now what you can see is you can see horizontal striations going through the stone. So it wasn't a conventional drill, as we think of drills, that bores this way. It was plowing its way through this stone. This is as hard or harder than granite. The only kind of tool that could do this kind of work is tungsten carbide, cobalt, or diamond technology. The Inca did not have that. The Inca had bronze chisels, and stone hammers. So of course, as I said before, archeologists always have to find an answer for a riddle. And this is one of the big riddles. Traditionally, what they say is that the gold idol was kept inside this recess. And the reason for all the holes was that they hung a textile down. However, again, this is incredibly hard stone. Any engineer I've showed this to said, that looks like an electrical panel to me. And that's from professional engineers. What is possible, because people are always saying, where is the ancient technology, is that if this was some kind of electrical panel or device, over a period of time, the metal components of it would have been taken apart, especially if they were gold or silver or copper. And over time, whatever it was that was in here would have been stripped 
to the point where there's nothing. Some of these holes literally go in through the back of the wall as though they are conduits. And the position of this inside this building would make it look like it was indeed an electrical panel of some kind. In Washington, we met with another expert on ancient technology, Christopher Dunn. Chris is an experienced engineer who has studied the pyramids of ancient Egypt extensively for 20 plus years. We believe there may be a large correlation between the building styles of the ancient Egyptians and ancient Peruvians. The proof is quite clear to anybody who has had to work with materials and uh, they are automatically when they see or when they read about uh, the accomplishments of the ancient Egyptians, they, uh, they generally discard the traditional theory on how these artifacts were created. Where are the machines? So you, you want to argue that machines uh, created these artifacts, where are the machines? The ancient Egyptians were blessed with a very simple toolbox with uh, copper chisels, wooden mallets, stone hammers, stone chisels. I, I just totally reject the idea that, that those uh, were capable. They're not capable. I mean, nobody has proven that they're capable. So, you know, it's just a, it's, it's a, a, a huge open question. For people like myself, um, the artifacts themselves are evidence enough uh, that they, the work of machines and the work of uh, mechanical guidance a very sophisticated mechanical guidance in terms of how it functioned, uh, what drove it, what the power sources were, that remains to be found. This stone, because we can measure the volume, we can measure the height, the width, and the depth, we know the density of this stone is about 165 pounds per cubic foot. So this stone alone weighs 65 tons. Two-thirds of the way up this mountain is where the quarry is that this stone came from. So they had to hew the stone in rough form from the quarry. They had to move it down the mountain to the valley floor, across the valley floor, up on top of this hill, shape it, and put it into place. So originally it might have weighed a hundred times. I believe the architects of uh, this stone forming um, where the giants, the elongated skeletons, I believe are the remains of giants and possibly Atlanteans. The Pirawas and other ancient cultures whose remains have been found across the Americas feature biological anomalies that are unexplained to this day. It is believed a majority of the abnormal skeletal remains have been found in Peru. We were fortunate enough to see many of the skulls and remains in person and were astounded by what we saw. Of course, I always hear stories of somebody was tall and over time, exaggeration starts to yeah. come in. So Zeus was six feet tall. And then a hundred years later, Zeus was eight feet tall. And then a few hundred years later, he was 12 feet tall. Mm -hmm. So that's the trouble. You have to go back and, you know, you have to decode the mythology realize that what it is is poetic in, in general, mm -hmm. and uh, then try to find the reality inside the mythology. So this is Chongos, which is a royal spiritual center of the Paracas people. It's a massive graveyard. All of the largest elongated skulls in the world have been found at this site. So the ones especially that you see that people claim are alien, or Nephilim, or Anunnaki, or whatever. Basically, they're all from this one site in the desert near Paracas, Peru. Paracas skulls of Peru are the largest and most highly so-called deformed skulls probably in the history of the world that we know of. Again, here we have our control sample. And what you're looking at again, the important feature is you have three cranial plates. And that is typical of you and me, and any human being. But this one, if you look carefully, you'll see there's one suture here and none there. There is no suture, nor is there a sign that there was a suture there. So this one only has two cranial plates. Supposedly they weigh about 
up to twice as much as a normal skull and some of them even have like up to 250 percent more brain capacity i mean i would assume with twice as much brain size you could definitely would have some more brain power now most uh, physicians who have been here and physically looked at these say that it's natural that as a person ages that the sutures start to disappear because there's more calcification but they can't explain why there is absolutely no sign of there ever having been a suture here. That's quite an anomaly. And the other interesting feature is if you look in the back of the skull here, you see these two holes. And some would say that's part of the cranial deformation process. But if you look here on the mandible, the lower part of the jaw, you see that hole. That is called a foramen, and what it is for is for nerve and blood flow to come out to feed this part of the skull. And doctors theorize that this is the same thing. So it is possible that because this skull may have been naturally born this way, that the foramen here are an evolutionary thing that allows the back of the skull to be fed because it's not the normal human shape. So this may be where nerves and or blood vessels came out to feed the back of the skull. And it's one possible piece of evidence that this is an evolutionary process and not a ceremonial binding process. This is one of the largest ones in the Paracas Museum collection. And you can see the level of deformation or alteration in shape as compared to our control sample here. If I put them side to side like that, you see the profound difference. It is possible that this one is cranial deformation, but it's a very complicated shape because not only is the forehead flattened extremely, but there is no sign of there being a suture here in the parietal region. And again, this one does have the holes in the back of the skull and the hair is red, and it's typical of the elongated skulls of Peru, especially Paracas, that the skull has natural red hair, which is not a Native American characteristic. Most, if not all Native Americans, genetically, if they're pure-blooded Native Americans, have black hair, but there are many oral traditions stating that even before the Native people arrived in many areas of North, Central, and South America, that other people were living there. And those people had wavy red hair exactly as this example that I'm holding in my hands. After traveling through Peru, we then traveled to Boston, Massachusetts to meet with Jim Vieira. Jim is a researcher and author who has devoted many years to uncovering lost information regarding giant remains around the world. One thing I will say is that you have all these reports all around the country reporting the same strange anatomic anom anomaly sometimes, like double rows of teeth, massive jaw bones that could be fit over the head. In an era of com inefficient communication, all around the country, uh, in buried often obscurely in, in, in historical documents like town histories, you have from Catalina Island, California to Martha's Vineyard, Mass, buried in you know scientific American or town histories, these same descriptions. Basically, every mound site or uh, pyramid site in the U.S., the, the most notable ones have giant skeleton accounts associated with them. Grave Creek, Cahokia, Newark, Chillicothe, you know, Sparrow, Moundville. It's just amazing. One thing I'll say is when the explorers showed up, when, when Coronado, Vespucci, John Smith in, in, in Virginia, they all encountered giant uh, native chiefs, giant native rulers. When the giant was on his knees, our tallest man couldn't reach his chest. And you know, th this, this giant was nine feet tall. This giant was over eight feet tall. You have these firsthand accounts in Patagonia and other places, not just of, of people unusually tall, but of giant stature. George Sheldon, 1895, the town history of Deerfield, a thousand page document. I'm reading through and I asked the curator at the library, I'm like, do you know that Sheldon reports an eight foot skeleton with double rows of teeth in the town history. And he said, no, he said, but here's his archeological scrapbook. Maybe this is of interest to you. And then I started to find multiple giant skeleton accounts, seven and eight foot in Homer, Ohio, nine foot in Cattaraugus County, um, uh, New York, seven foot double rows of teeth in Hadley, Mass. And I was like, taken aback, like, wow. Then I found that not only that, they had skeletal remains on display at the museum 
And in the, uh, the Relics and Curiosity book, uh, 1883, I found that they had the thigh bone of an at least eight foot uh, skeleton from Marion County, Ohio, that was on display. I spoke with the physical anthropologist who reinterred the remains. Um, they were on display, and because of NAGPRA laws, several years ago, they reinterred those remains. Seven, seven footers in Montague, Mass. You know, it's like, oh my God, you know. And these are, this is before I got into Google Books and search engines. I read through thousands of pages over months of time, carefully going through these boring genealogies and everything, and then finding these accounts with these strange anatomic anomalies like double rows of teeth. To date, we've amassed about 1,500 of these accounts all around the country from any, every manner of um, historical and scientific doc document, town histories, county histories, Smithsonian ethnology reports, New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, every newspaper you can imagine, anthropological bulletins, archeological uh, bulletins, from university and uh, trained archeologists and anthropologists also, not just you know, uh, farmers finding these uh, things in the fields. When the European settlers came through the Americas, they took over and destroyed the native civilizations that inhabited the land. Is it possible they may have also buried some incredibly important information about humans and our symbiotic connection to this earth? Is it possible that the natives had some better solutions regarding energy and agriculture that could have the potential to save our society from ultimate destruction? The Earth is an electromagnetic being, frankly, and uh, structures are built to harness that and to create harmony. And obviously, we, our civilization is the antithesis of that. You know, we create the heart project and we pave everything over. And that lack of reverence for the Earth is backfiring on us now as a society. As Nikola Tesla said, the, the same biological frequencies that run through our body run through the Earth, run through the universe. You, you can put standing stones in the ground to harness this energy, and, and these structures, I believe, they were beneficial for crop production, for peace, for harmony. There, there is something that, through the interaction of certain materials in certain sites, uh, vortexes, if you will, create our harmonious existence in, in the people. I, I really think that's a reality, and it sounds like, oh, that's esoteric and hocus pocus, but no, I, I think there's a real science to it. This is called the Seike system. It's an energy grid designed by the Inca, or possibly inherited by the Inca. It was their belief that energy emanated from the city of Cusco outwards in all directions. Within Cusco, it was actually from the Corte Cancha, the building we're in, and within the Corte Cancha, that strange stone tub that we saw in the center. Either energy is coming into the Corte Cancha or moving out. But this is the map designed by the Incas themselves and their knowledge that this energy system existed. I personally believe that what they inherited was the Corte Cancha itself, that it was built thousands of years before them and it was an energy radiating center. The reason why the Inca adopted this site as their very special sacred site is because the builders thousands of years ago who originally constructed it were using it for some kind of pragmatic energy function and there still is residual energy present. A lot of sacred sites in the world are like that. They have underground water or some kind of other energy that makes the site special and a lot of the cathedrals in Europe are built on top of older shrines which are energetic places. This is exactly that sort of thing. The original top of this building had a gold sheet that went all the way around it. It was capped in gold. And the thing is that since this rock is energetic, it contains a lot of quartz crystal and iron, it's possible that what the gold cap originally functioned as was as a circuit. It made the building like an energetic circuit so that when you walked inside the building, the energy was different than the outside of the building. And therefore, you would go into an alternate state of consciousness. Now, of course, the Spanish, the first thing they did was tore the gold capping off of it. And the Inca made it into a religious building, but before that, I think it had a pragmatic function, like some kind of factory or some kind of energy processing place. And that's why the stone had to be so tightly fit together, because the building itself had to vibrate as one unit. In Washington, we met with an engineer and researcher named John Cadman. John has created a scale model replica of the subterranean chamber pulse generator under the Great Pyramid of Giza. This is an incredibly important discovery to understand because it can be the first proof of concept 
regarding ancient technology. This discovery may give us great insight into the ways of the ancient past. What would something like this have been used for? How did and why did they create something like this? The questions may be endless. Hopefully, we have not lost touch too much to understand the importance of this discovery. I saw this book on the shelf, 5-5-2000, in the alternate history sort of area. I checked it out. I was just looking at the pictures and the drawings, and I came across Edward Kunkel's uh, pictures, and he had said it was used as some sort of pump. And so I'd re I reproduced that same model back in June of 1999. April 3rd, 2000, first try it ran. Pushed the valve in once and it started running. Immediately what happened, the whole 500 pound block of cement and rock and rebar was pulsing. Like, boom, 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 boom. And the first thing that came to mind was exactly what Chris Dunn had written, that there was a pulse that was emanating from that room, but he knew the mechanism was in there. Immediately I knew, oh my God, Chris, you're right. I added a model with a glass top and a glass side. And I used little ink jets, but I had little nozzles and valves on the side of it so I could determine all the fluid di dynamics within the room. And I was absolutely shocked to find that it was a vortex in there. It was an extremely complex vortex. It had a heartbeat pulse at the time. And if you set it up a certain way, it actually does the pulse of a heart. It doesn't do a consistent, you know, like one second per se. One second pulses, bump, bump, bump. It was actually doing strong in a short beat. Bump, 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 bump. Whatever it is, whoever designed this, that's what they wanted. And Chris was saying, you know, I had just come up with the name of a book and it had to do with the Great Pyramid, the heartbeat of a civilization. I, I think the evidence is, is fairly clear that uh, uh, particularly in Egypt, and if you consider the system that they built at Giza, the, the pyramids at Giza, the Great Pyramid uh, specifically, um, that they had developed a, uh, an energy system that uh, was harmonious. Uh, it was not only drawing energy from the earth, but it was harmonizing the plates and harmonizing the earth and probably transmitting those uh, frequencies throughout the planet. It's now become knowledge that these uh, standing stones like at Stonehenge, at Karnak, that they uh, actually do emit particular uh, frequencies. In Washington, John Cabin gave us a tour of his scale model pyramid pulse generator. This device works completely off a of gravity feed and no power is required. The implications of this technology are great, including energy and agricultural benefits. If it was the Great Pyramid, this would be the moat around it. That'd be the water level of the moat. Is this kind of a static water level. And then there's just a pipe that feeds from that. just down to, down through here. So it just drops straight down in here. And then it's got the little room inside the cement casing. So it's, it's pumping water right now over to the far side of the house, so about 400 feet away and elevating it from here. And uh, so this would be, in the Great Pyramid, this would be the dead end shaft here. This, this shaft here, and this would be the shaft here that would go down to the Nile, which would just have a very simple valve in it. And so if you shut this, it, it changes the pressure, and it'll change this rate and the intensity. Immediately. Whoever designed it, they used the back pressure to change the, the pulse rate and the frequency, the frequency and the amplitude to, to tune it for the, the, the pyramid itself. For the 
variations in the atmospheric pressure plus the temperature of the water because the temperature of the water changes the the viscosity of the water and that changes the 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 speed of the sound wave traveling through the water. So you have okay. to have a simple way to tune it. And all you have to do would be slightly close a valve or open a valve. And okay. you could tune the whole frequency of the building just by, it'd be a very simple valve, like a little screw valve. The pulse is what causes the, the engine to start running. It's for the king's chamber. The King's Chamber is a freestanding, it's completely, it's a crystal room because it's rose quartz granite. It's freestanding from the exterior limestone walls and it's tuned. So when you cause that to resonate, the whole King's Chamber would resonate all by itself. And that would cause the machine to start running. This is technology that has been proven, that's been on this planet since before the end of the Ice Age. All the archaeological evidence at points to that was pre-flood, and that was 12,000 years ago, was the flood. Energized water would increase the health of the plants, which we eat, increase our health, which is not necessarily a bad thing. The size of the pyramid itself would do it to a scale which would affect essentially all the fish, the animals, the people, the plants of that whole area or whole part of the globe for free, forever. Nothing required other than let the water flow.